62 home runs were on the up for the Brits, making a bid to escape from Colditz. In the early years of the war, escaping from Colditz meant seizing any opportunity that arose. The French had success, but it involved a good deal of luck. But 1942 heralded a new dawn. For the first time, British escapers could rely upon the collective ingenuity of the camp to help them on their way. Gadgets and devices were made to order or smuggled in. This was the era of the great British escapes. In 1942, Hitler's grip on occupied Europe tightened. His navy was pinning down the Allies in the North Atlantic. His armies driving on towards Moscow and deeper into North Africa. Every Allied attempt to make landfall on the continent failed. From every front, the survivors were captured and prisoners sent back to Germany. And the persistent escapers arrived at Kolditz. The Germans had this maddening phrase they spouted at you when you were first captured. They thought they were being kind, I think. For sie, der Krieg ist vorbei, der Krieg ist verendet, and all this. For you, the war is over. It jolly well wasn't going to be over. And this was the one thing we could do and should do would be to escape. The German officer said, we know you will go on trying to escape. We are going to send you to the bad boys camp. And that's how it came about that I went to Kolditz. And there was this grim looking castle in front of us. We went in and the noise absolutely burst on us. And the windows in front were full of grinning faces, all shouting. And there were tables underneath them, with Germans sitting at them. Well, as we stood in front of these tables, um, water bombs suddenly appeared through the windows above, landing on the Germans, landing on the papers. And then finally, a blazing palliasse was stuffed out. And with that, the Germans reacted. I remember thinking to myself, you know, to be here where people obviously treated the Germans with complete disdain uh, was great. I thought, my God, the morale here is, is first rate. This bad behavior did not go unpunished but the German soldiers remained remarkably tolerant of these high spirits. It was a private war between the cream of the British officers and their rank and file guards, goon baiting. You're stuck in there, the 400 of you all milling around. It's a diversion, you just have to. It's rather like being at a party and, and popping somebody's balloon. Anything to uh irritate the Germans, it was a good thing. Mm. Yeah, they're friends now, I may <laughs> I personally felt rather embarrassed by some of these um, shows of what you might call, by the men of spirit, I think we called them. But the system says thou shalt give trouble to the enemy, or make a bit of aggro, because it ties up people. It, it was more than just idle. Uh, amusement, goon baiting, yes, but um, the irritation was deliberate. Uh, we had something to hide. You had to attract their attention or distract them so that they didn't really 
what, what was going on. Goon baiting helped to conceal Colditz's fledgling escape industry. And now this received official support from London. MI9 was a newly formed branch of the British Secret Service set up to help captured prisoners escape. They produced a range of escape gadgets that could be concealed in everyday objects. There was a whole sub-industry during the war run by MI9 for providing escape aids, concealing them in things, and smuggling them in to prisoners through the international parcels post. Everything was, of course, carefully camouflaged so that if the Germans did open and search the parcel, they ought not to be able to find what they were not supposed to find in it. You might get sent a pack of cards. If you drop them into water, the card peels off, and if you put 52 of them together, you've got a very good map of Germany, probably with the Swiss frontier thrown in. Another one, a pencil clip. Nothing more ordinary than a pencil on a clip, which one could wear in one's pocket quite normally. But in fact, it's a tiny compass. You balance it on the top of the pencil, and it shows you where north is. Very convenient device. Or you could have one in the top of a fountain pen. Perfectly ordinary, rather solid fountain pen. If you take the top off it, there's your compass. I suddenly had a parcel with a board game from Anne French. Well, I think back as far as I could. I could never think of an Anne French. I suddenly thought, oh, I'll try and rip this out and see what's in it. And pulling the board apart, sure enough, there was some paper German money in it. And great excitement. I thought, oh, yes, I'll put this by. It wasn't on about a week I had it, and somebody came to me, had I had any contraband? Anyhow, I had to hand the money to the escape committee. MI9 came up with increasingly ingenious methods of concealing escape aids and foxing the Germans. MI9 had an arrangement with HMV that HMV could cast a record with a map inside it. And word would go in by coded letter, when a record playing the British Grenadiers arrives, drop it. Somebody dropped one and it broke. And there in the middle of it was a map, a, a very thin map. And people said, oh, goodness, and there was an orgy of breaking all our very precious gramophone records, seeing if there was any other maps. There were no other maps, and we'd broken all our records. It was rather sad. But the Germans started opening the parcels and finding the contraband. They even installed an X-ray machine. So now the prisoners had to steal the parcels before they were vetted. This meant getting past two locked doors and a guard. The British took their lead from the French. The colis delivery all the parcels here. Alors, ils se mettaient, je vous dis, il y avait la sentinelle, elle n'était pas là, mais enfin, elle était là, quoi, à 10 mètres, en plein jour, en plein jour. Alors, some uh, prisoner had a talk with a sentinel, you see, pour éviter, toi, qu'il surveille. Et Guig se mettait comme ça, hein, the back, uh, et dans son dos, avec, avec sa clé, il ouvrait, il rentrait. He then had a short amount of time to get past an alarmed door and identify which parcel concealed contraband. 
The clue was the colour of the label. His name was Gig. He was like that. He's a champion. Gig is a champion. No prisoner was ever caught breaking into the parcel office, but it was a dangerous and unreliable system. Increasingly, officers came to rely on their own ingenuity. When you're up against it, you can do all sorts of things. When you can think of it, people got all strange of ideas of one kind or another. And, um, and their aptitudes suddenly appear. There was a heavy door with a metal plate on it and we wanted to find out what was holding it. And this was what we made. You see there's a little looking glass, a little bit of looking glass there, and it's supported like that, and you can open it like that. So you can thread it through the keyhole, and then you made it set up, and you can turn it back and forth and look at the back of the door. And we found uh, where it was, that there was a big hook on their side, we then went with a, with a hook and hook it off. Only a few maps made it into the camp from London, but every potential escaper would need one. Kenneth Lockwood came up with a novel idea of how to duplicate them. I simply said, well, when I was at prep school, I, uh, I used to print a uh, uh, a small sort of newsletter for uh, our form, and uh, I said I, I, I did it on uh, uh, gelatine. We've got jellies in our Red Cross parcels, and so we tried it out. It had to be lemon. You had to have a light-coloured jelly. Now, all that's got to happen is for the jelly to set. And I've got the, uh, the tracing that uh, we want to uh, print. So it goes onto the jelly. And the jelly picked up the outline of the document and came out onto your piece of paper. A miniature form of a printing press. <laughs> of course, it could only do a certain amount of copies. Well, then, uh, it was never wasted, we ate it. In the late summer of 1942, the British escape industry was hard at work making jelly maps and keys for their most daring attempt yet to break out of Colditz. This clandestine activity was protected by an elaborate system of lookouts known as stooges. you had a signal to show which entrance uh, they were going, which staircase they were going to. There would be somebody in one of those windows over the way reading a book. The arrangement was that they would suddenly close the book. Directly you got that. The uh, chaps just covered up what they were doing and carried on. And the Germans, they couldn't see anything. The equipment was being prepared for the British escape officer himself, Pat Reed. Reed had been foiled three times already and was keener than anyone to get out. His latest plan was mad. So mad that it might even work. In full view of the searchlights, he would break out of the prisoners' quarters and into the German courtyard. Avoiding the sentries, he would then unlock a door that led into a disused staircase. Once there, he hoped to find a window that opened onto the terrace below. At midnight on the 14th of October, 
Pat Reed and his three accomplices began their escape. Once over the roof of the German kitchen, Reed was out of sight of the sentry. He could only cross the courtyard when the sentry's back was turned. For this, an elaborate stooging plan had been hatched. There was an orchestra playing right up in the uh, theater. And the idea was that when it was all right to go, the orchestra would stop playing and uh, they would get across the courtyard. But the trouble was that suddenly the orchestra stopped playing and the orchestra didn't start again. And uh, uh, I don't know why. Nobody do seems to know why the orchestra ceased to play. So they had to rely on their own ears for listening to where the sentry was. It wasn't easy. Once across the courtyard, Reed approached the door for which he had made a skeleton key. He wrestled with it for over an hour. This is the key that Pat had. Unfortunately, it would not open this door. There was nothing that could be done. I mean, he had to, uh, as he couldn't get through here, he had to find some other means of getting away. With the odds stacked against them, the escapers had no option but to carry on. Reed led them along the edge of the barracks to where he thought there was a cellar. He was right. Pat realized that this passage quite obviously led to the outer wall. Pat looked up and saw that there was a, a gap, but it is very narrow. The hole looks too small for anyone of Reed's size and build to get through. Legend has it that he tried by stripping to the skin. So really one could call it the naked escape. <laughs> okay. 57 years later, Kenneth Lockwood has asked Peter Schneider, who is the same size as Reed, to attempt it. Okay. Give up. Now, now up. Yeah. Straighten your legs out. That's it. Straighten them out. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, You're going. You're doing all right. First class. <laughs> Difficult, but it it was right. Exactly how, how it must have been done. My bag is scratched. Ah, fucky. Mm. Ah. They were strong guys, I think. With his jelly map and compass to guide him, Pat Reed and his three companions crossed the border into Switzerland. The British officers had achieved their first major success, and the Germans never discovered how it was done. Pat Reed's escape was one of 84 attempts from Colditz in 1942. Most failed, but their frequency and ingenuity even surprised the prisoners. You couldn't expect every single attempt to succeed. Some of the attempts were really quite, uh, uh, well, uh, <laughs> shall we say, extraordinary. Mm -hmm. 
One day we were walking back from the park. Suddenly the, there was a lady walking in the opposite direction to us, perfectly turned out. Uh, and sort of people just sort of looked and it didn't worry them. And then she dropped her wristwatch. One of the British officers saw it and being a gallant gentleman, said, excuse me, but you've dropped your watch. Well, the guards really hadn't bothered very much about her walking down, and they realised that there shouldn't be a lady walking down here. It was indeed no lady, but a French officer in disguise. The British had mistakenly blown his escape. Another depended upon the athletic prowess of its architect, an Olympic gymnast called Don Tom. Now, Don Tom came out from the arrest cells, and what he did was to go straight to over here. He leapt right in the corner onto the bars of that first window, and then down to the next window, and down to the one at the bottom. I mean, the drop was about 40 feet. The Germans, of course, never suspected that anybody would attempt that, and they started firing. They didn't hit him, because he got over the wall down the end, but he unfortunately got picked up. Pity. Yet another involved the local electrician called Willie and a piece of Gallic guile. The French ha had a, a, a fellow Perodo who was remarkably like Willie. So they fused the lights in the castle. Of course, Willie had to come in and he got on with his job of getting the lights right and Perodo went out, dressed exactly as Willie. Unfortunately, they had just changed the colours of the passes, and he was caught. Every time officers were captured, the Germans would make them reenact their escapes for the camera. Every attempt foiled meant another hole was stopped up. Though there was an escape almost every week, the security officer, Eggers, believed he was getting the upper hand. The prisoners and we were engaged in a permanent game of leapfrog. First we were ahead with our security barriers, then they were scheming around them. The experts had to lay on absolute masterpieces to beat us. By now the Germans had amassed a treasure trove of escape equipment. And they knew there was much more hidden in the prisoners' quarters. They became experts at finding it. The search started with a whole lot of Germans suddenly rushing into a room where people were reading and writing and so on. Make everybody move out and then they'd really set about the, the room. They'd tear up most of the floor. Every palace emptied out. They'd really go every inch of the, of the thing. And if there was anything there, they were likely to find it. Kolditz Castle still contains many secrets. Fifty-four years later, archaeologist Thomas Schmidt is still looking for hides, places where prisoners kept escape equipment. His extensive search of the British quarters has borne fruit. I found this hole, and there was this green bag, and nobody saw this bag before.
Good Lord. Only the man which, who put it in the hole. I, I had no idea who that could be. It's quite extraordinary. It's been here, what, 54 years. Let's have a look. A map. It's quite remarkable, this. A uniform. <laughs> South Wales yeah. uniform jacket. This looks like a, a homemade uniform that was intended to be used in an escape. Uh, and a forage cap. <laughs> Unbelievable. No. It's obviously a small man made this. Hmm. What's hmm. that? For colouring the cotton. For some reason, this jacket is the wrong colour, but we were sent dyes from London to take care of that. That's that green, isn't it? A wonderful find. A dyed uniform would be invaluable in the escape plan of Grizz David Schofield. He was an officer the Germans regarded as one of their most dangerous prisoners. The escaper must always escape. Look at the windows, try the door, <laughs> see what the walls are made of, you know, automatically. He wasn't going to be locked up without a jolly good try to get, to get out of it. And I like to think I was like that too, a bit. Grizz had got hold of a stolen German uniform which was the wrong colour. He altered it and dyed it grey. His plan then was simply to walk out of the castle disguised as a German corporal. But he needed to find a way out of the prisoner's courtyard. Every week a box of rubbish was taken out of the gate and into the German part of the camp. It was carried by two Scottish orderlies captured soldiers who worked for the Germans. They might be able to get him inside that box. I had the uh, civilian clothes that I'd made on. I had the German NCO's uniform over the top of that and a sort of dungaree over the top of that. And I suppose to hide up everything, I probably had a cloak as well. And I pushed into this very unpleasant cart. It was jolly small. I couldn't possibly do it today, I'm not supple enough. But they got me into it and then covered over with the cardboard and the paper and everything else. They brought me out, the two orderlies, carried me out, and I hoped, because it wasn't very comfortable, that they'd take me straight through that door, not a bit of it. The German corporal, the hawk, as we called him, decided that he had some business to do in the camp and he told the two chaps to put me down in the courtyard and wait till he returned. And I could see through a crack in the box some of my friends going past and uh, thinking, well, I wonder if he knows I'm lying in this beastly box. However, all went well, we picked up, and down we went straight to the door, or used to be to us the sort of barrier between freedom and imprisonment. Through this great big door, and on we went. And I remember just about where we are now, one of the orderlies said under his breath, I can't hold him. And the other chap said, we're nearly there, man. Just hang on, keep it up. Well, they took me into here, dumped me down. It was there, lower this, down, down some steps, and dumped me down in there covered over by some of this rubbish and all I had to do was to wait for quite a considerable time. I then emerged from my pile. I took my dungaree I was wearing off and leaving me dressed as a German corporal and uh, got out my little mirror, smartened myself up as best I could, made sure my hat was straight on my head and uh, that I was all ready to emerge. I waited until I was sure there were plenty of German soldiers walking about, hoped I was looking not very obviously like a British officer escaping dressed as a German corporal. And I joined in with them, walked down, 
this way. Nobody spoke to me, luckily. That was the most exciting and decisive moment of my escape. Whether I could walk across there amongst all those German soldiers without being suspected at all. Chris walked across the courtyard unchallenged. Once through the gateway, he was free. It was a great moment to sort of smell the autumn countryside and be walking in amongst all these leaves. I crossed the stream way up to the top there and I, I was gone. Discarding his German uniform, Grizz continued his journey as a civilian. The only way was to, to act normal when you were out, to act like the rest of the civilians. Bought a railway ticket to Leipzig. I had no intention of going to Leipzig because I knew that probably the security, if they discovered my escape, they might have an extra watch there. Grizz was able to slip away from Kolditz because the German authorities did not even know he had escaped. His place had been taken by a ghost. Who invented the name ghost? I can't imagine. Uh, it was a very good summing up of, our, of what we were. That, I mean, well, we were ghosts, as you might say. We were there, but not present, and didn't want to be seen by the Germans, but the other people could see us. Jack Best had faked his own escape nine months previously. The Germans believed he had gone. In fact, he had never left the castle. Whenever anyone made an escape, he would cover for them. One of the ghosts at each particular time would be on duty representing me. He would come out from his hiding, live a normal life, sleep in my bed, um, eat in my mess, we counted. We could take their place, well disguised on parade, and then we went back again quickly. Uh, I may say we'd taken bottles to fill with us for, for the necessities of life down there. It was a, a great uh, sacrifice that they made in becoming ghosts, because not only was it a very uncomfortable sort of life, they couldn't write home to their families. Their families wouldn't know where they were, why they disappeared, all very worrying. It was quite a noble thing to do, to be a ghost. Good undertaking. With his ghost in place, Grizz made good progress, but he had to keep his head down. One would be bound to think, well, I must be an obviously escaping prisoner of war. I must be obvious to everybody. One had sort of uh, tricks of the trade a little bit that wouldn't attract too much conversation and so on, like producing a book and burying yourself in it. Grizz very nearly made it. Only a hundred miles short of the Dutch border, he was questioned by suspicious soldiers and recaptured. I got quite a long way that time, I was eventually caught. But then I was able to say I had a lovely trip round Germany. According to legend, Kolditz Castle was packed with die-hard escapers, all desperate to get out. In fact, the escapers at Kolditz were in the minority. The atmosphere there was a curious one because you've got people who had settled down, as it were, and going to see the war out. There were people who wanted to escape and they arrived at a place where it was pretty hopeless to escape from. I admired the escapers enormously, of course I did. 
but I felt that somebody ought to consider why we were there at all, why the war had started, why there should be any wars. I wrote uh, two books and gave very, very left-wing talks, mainly on Marxism, about which I knew not very much, but something. And of course, in prison, um, you have a captive audience, so they listen to anything, really. They listen to me. And it was very fortunate because it gave a kind of um, escape within myself without having to try to um, get out. But I did admire them tremendously. I mean, lots of people did, didn't try and escape and uh, accepted the situation and so on. Well, that was a good thing. People who were trying to escape weren't against those who didn't want to escape. They were only too thankful. That was one of the difficulties of Colgate. You could be told your lovely scheme was good enough, but not this year. Next year, he would say, yes, next year. We, we don't want anything, any activity in that part of the camp this year. We've got two escapes being planned there, and I'm afraid you must wait. By the spring of 1943, the escape committee had a good reason for holding all the would-be escapers back. They had a plan that, if successful, would eclipse everything attempted so far. In late 1942, the game of cat and mouse between prisoners and their guards took a darker turn. Once out of Colditz, escaping British officers could no longer rely on leniency towards them. The Geneva Convention, we felt, was behind us all the time and uh, escaping prisoners were not supposed to be shot. But of course, if the escaping prisoner dresses up to look like a, a civilian, well, he's taking his life in his hands, but it's just rather a dangerous game he's playing. Hitler put it more starkly. In October, he decreed that any Allied officers caught in or out of uniform in Germany were to be treated as spies and shot. The man who played this game to the limit was Mike Sinclair. A professional soldier before the war, he spoke fluent German and had escaped four times before arriving at Kolditz. He became legendary because he was absolutely determined to carry out which, strictly speaking, is the duty of every prisoner to escape. He made what turned out to be the rest of his life a single-handed battle between himself and the whole of Hitler's occupied Europe. He was so determined that he never thought of anything else. I'd wake up in the night, because we were usually in the same room, and there would be this solitary figure at the window just watching, absorbing information, anything that might be useful to him. It's amazing, really, amazing person. Sinclair was the central player in the most audacious attempt to break out of Kolditz. The idea was to imitate Feldwebel Rothenberger, known to the prisoners as Franz Joseph. This sergeant was a veteran of the First World War, his distinctive appearance invited disguise. The minute you saw those moustaches coming round the corner, you didn't start asking questions or looking to see who the hell it was. You knew who it was. He reeked of moustaches and medals and militarism, and I think that the Germans obey what they thought they saw. The idea that a German guard would always obey his senior officer formed the basis of the plan. Disguised as Franz Joseph, Mike Sinclair intended to impersonate him on his nightly inspection of the sentries. Hoping they would not look at him too closely, Sinclair would relieve them. British officers disguised as guards would take their place. Finally, he would dismiss the guard on the main terrace gate that led out of the castle. The intent was that Franz Joseph, having relieved the guards, was then going to open the doors and the windows uh, and let the 40 or 50 people out in, in a pretty well-organized mass breaker. 
it was vital that Mike looked exactly like him. It was vital, therefore, that Mike did everything exactly the same way as this felt table did. Well, Mike watched him, talking to people, everything about Franz Joseph. Then he, he looked out of the window, and he saw how Franz Joseph came up. Everything about it. It went on for weeks and weeks. Timing, meticulous, it had to be. It was pretty difficult to tell when he was made up that he wasn't the real felt fable. And then there was all the equipment, enormous amount of equipment had to be made. Rifles, dummy rifles, dummy bayonets, uniforms with buttons and badges and everything. The preparations were the fascinating part. I mean, it took months. The escape industry went into overdrive. Cardboard and boot polish became a leather holster. Franz Joseph's hat was meticulously copied. And ropes to carry 30 escaping prisoners from the windows to the ground were prepared. Each of the 30 escapers would need a forged pass to travel around Germany. This was called an Ausweis. This is where the time-consuming part came. It was difficult to copy in the Gothic writing because you couldn't do anything else after that. I mean, you couldn't scratch out a, a letter. I mean, that would, uh, you'd have to start again. Otherwise, the chap might get shot. I was going to go out as a Belgian worker because I could speak a bit of French, and I thought that they would excuse my bad accent. So I took the name of Leon Goussens, and so I had to sign that and get used to that. And I put black boot polish on my hair, and I, I hoped I would be slightly less obvious. The final stage was to rubber stamp the document. The Germans love rubber stamps, and so you put on half a dozen rubber stamps. The more stamps, the better. Someone would have produced a drawing of the stamp. I would then transfer that to a piece of sole um, material, which we got sent in through the Red Cross or somewhere, and then Using a razor blade, one would cut along these lines and then get rid of all the background. To do that with a razor blade, I do assure you, is bloody nearly impossible. And it would take all day, and it's just about as boring as paint drying. Um, this um, police stamp was the normal one, and then we used to use indelible pencil and spit which is as good as any, and then go round all the lettering and the eagle in the middle. It did look like a stamp if not examined too closely. Now let's hopefully this will come out. Stamp it down. You must give it, that is not too bad. That would pass. Their papers complete. The escapers now needed to hide these precious documents. Pat Reed had some cigars sent to him uh, by some friends of his, and uh, they all arrived in their case. Well, now I've still got mine. It was the name that gave us the clue as to how to uh, secrete our papers when you were escaping. I think probably the first time was probably slightly painful, but uh, you got used to it. We used to walk like a cow cowboy. Oh, yes. Good Lord. Not for very long. You could move about all right, but uh, you, you couldn't carry out your functions. <laughs> Only at specific times. <laughs> the escaping officer's final task was to prepare their exits. This was a laborious process. When you do cut a bar, there's a tremendous amount of noise. It might take a week. 
You do a very, very slow cut like that and back. Uh, there had to be somebody with a mirror or something watching the guard underneath so that he was not too close. The last cut was done a oh, minute before we went. On the night of the 2nd of September, 1943, the plan went into action. Mike Sinclair and his two guards broke out onto the terrace. I was up at one of these windows back here, one of the far windows along there, and my job was to report uh, what happened when they reached the sentry immediately below me. And I could see them coming, Mike and the two people with him, dressed up. I'd been told they were about to arrive. And they came up to the sentry. I could hear what Mike was saying about reporting back to the guardroom. And the sentry clicked his heels and marched away. And so I was able to report quietly to across the room to the chap waiting for my report saying, OK, second sentry, duly relieved. We were watching it keenly because we had windows which were ready to come out, uh, ropes which we were going to get down into the moat. Sinclair now approached the third sentry. He was also fooled by the disguise. All that remained now was the guard on the main terrace gate. I heard Mike say something to him, and I heard an argument starting. Mike spoke perfect German. He raised his voice and started giving very severe orders to do what he was told, and this and that, and there was an emergency on. And I could hear this argument going back and forth. I could hear the sentry saying, Nein, Herr Feldwebel. The guard became suspicious because Sinclair's pass was the wrong colour. He raised the alarm. I was one of the first on the scene, just behind the relief officer. There were two or three others ahead of me. Sinclair had become nervous. He was desperate to succeed. Sinclair reached for his pistol case and the German officer thought he was going to shoot. Up above, there was a great outcry. They all screamed, you German murderers, you bloody murderers. Sinclair had fooled us all. One of the guards standing right next to the officer said, Jesus Christ, you've shot Rottenberger. And he really believed Sinclair was the old sergeant. He couldn't tell the difference. The bullet missed Sinclair's heart by an inch. He was taken to the Colditz hospital and lived to try again. I thought he was over ambitious, but I would also back up to say it was a great attempt. It was the greatest attempt, really, from Colditz to get a lot of people out in a rather dramatic way, to play them at their own game and impersonate one of their principal personalities in the campus it would have been a tremendous thing. The Franz Josef attempt ended the great era of escapes from Colditz. From now on, the Germans would have the upper hand. To outwit them, the prisoners looked up to one of the few exits left open, the sky.
And with the sky in mind, the prisoners planned one of the most spectacular attempts ever to escape from Colditz. The series concludes next Monday at 9 o'clock.